Thanks, Peter, and thanks to the uh, organizers of the conference for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the short answer to the question I've been asked to talk about what is the best uh, treatment strat strategy is, I don't know. But the longer answer will take me about 20 minutes to go through here, and um, I promise to sort of keep us on schedule here. This is a slide that I borrowed um, uh, from Kieran Dunleavy at the NCI. He's a much better graphic artist than I am, but I think it's important to remember who are these double expression or double protein, and I use those terms interchangeably, uh, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphomas versus who are the double hit lymphomas. It's important to remember the double hit lymphomas really truly fall in the GCB category. The double protein lymphomas probably uh, 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 go into both sides of that um, in terms of GCB and non-GCB, and they're a much larger population as well. Um, but I think that's a helpful uh, Venn diagram to sort of conceptualize these patients. Now, this is the extent of my graphic artist abilities, and this is more talking about numbers. We don't have an ICD-9 or 10 code for these. They're not tracked by SEER. But roughly speaking, we think that they make up anywhere from 8 to 20 percent of diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Now, where does that data come from? We don't have, like I said, very good tracking of who these are. For a review paper we published in Cancer last year, we actually just went through and we calculated the numbers based on uh, uh, papers that have been presented. And you can see there's wide variability in percentage of MIC rearrangement and percentage of double hit lymphomas. But if you total them all together, roughly speaking, we're looking at about 12% of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients. The think important take home is most of the papers you look at, once you have that MIC rearrangement, you're actually more likely than not to have that second insult, to have a BCL2 rearrangement. So most of these patients are, uh, who have MIC rearrangements are actually double hits. Now that makes a difference if you look at, if we take a step back and just start with MIC rearrangement alone, we know that has an impact with respect to progression-free and overall survival when patients are treated with RCHOP. Um, and that comes from several different papers. And we know that that can be irrespective of the uh, IPI. MIC sort of uh, gives you a worse prognosis in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. MIC rearrangement gives you a worse prognosis irrespective of, of your uh, IPI risk stratification. We also know that uh, once you have the MIC rearrangement, so this comes from the NCI study, uh, prospective study looking at dose-adjusted EPOC, uh, that the BCL2 rearrangement, um, that, that EPOC may help to abrogate the negative impact of a BCL2 rearrangement, and that's in comparison to sort of older, again, retrospective data suggesting that BCL2 positivity by, by rearrangement among MIC positive patients uh, uh, tends to do much poorly. So this is some early data to suggest that maybe there is some some abrogation of the negative impact of BCL2 in these uh, uh, MIC rearranged patients. But it's important to remember the EPOC study has very short follow-up so far, and it's a single-arm study, and we don't really know, the, you know whether that's going to, to pan out. What we have also looked at is how do you look at MIC rearrangement, and what is the significance of, for instance, gain of copy or amplification and there are different definitions of exactly what that means. This is a, um, going to be presented at ASH this year. And we went back with investigators at Penn, and we just sort of tabulated in large numbers retrospectively, irrespective of the treatment. If you take diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients and you look at their MIC amplification, there's maybe a little bit of a downgrade, but certainly not as much in the PFS and OS as if they have a true MIC rearrangement and subsequently if they have that second hit. And so the more insults you add in this sort of fashion, the worse these patients tend to do. And so as a result, we tend not to look at MIC amplification or gain of copy number as being that clinically significant. But it is another active area of active research I think needs better definition in terms of what the, the clinical significance of those findings are. We see them all the time in our PATH reports. I don't know if anyone else um, you know, struggles with that issue. but. Uh, I don't think it means the same thing as a MIC rearrangement. Now, to answer the question of IHC versus FISH for defining these, these double expressors versus double hits, I think this is sort of the first paper that told us when you, have, when, when you take patients who are treated with RCHOP, those double hits really seem to do a lot worse than the double expressors. 
We uh, combined, um, uh, in retrospective fashion, a large number of the true double hits. So these are all patients who have fish uh, defined rearrangement of MYC and rearrangement of BCL2 or BCL6 or all three. And we took 300 patients and we said, okay, depending on the regimen, how do these patients do? And it looks like if you use more intensive regimens, you achieve higher response rates as compared to our CHOP. You follow those out in terms of progression-free and overall survival, they seem to make a significant difference in PFS, though interestingly, when you look at overall survival, there is not a significant difference between the intensive regimens versus, versus RCHOP. MD Anderson did the same exact thing, essentially, focusing on three regimens, RCHOP, uh, hyper-CVAD, and dose-adjusted EPOC. One of the most interesting things to me is when you look at our paper versus theirs, the overall survival and progression-free survival curves are almost identical. There's this plateauing around 40%, uh, roughly 50% for the PFS and around 40% for the overall survival. And I like to think of this population really as the haves and the have-nots. There definitely is a plateau. I think we're curing about 40% of these patients with upfront treatment but the rest have an incredibly steep first part of that survival curve. Now, interestingly, in the MD Anderson data, whoops, I don't have a pointer here. If you look at how dose-adjusted EPOC does in their studies, it seemed better than, than others. So I think this is, per, and better than in our study. So I think, again, this is another retrospective experience, but I think there is sort of this sense that maybe EPOC might be pushing us in a better direction with these patients. And so just to circle back to the NCI study, this is, what, this is a prospective experience, again, with uh, MIC rearranged patients, irrespective of whether they have that second hit or not. And whether you look at BCL2 by IHC or FISH, it seems to give some negative impact to these patients when, they're all, when they all have MIC rearrangements. Now, could it be that BCL2 by IHC is an even better discriminator poor outcome. I don't think that's the case based on this, this type of experience, especially when we have short follow-up. But it might be important to recognize those patients who have BCL2 overexpression by, by IHC, not simply by, by uh, FISH. One of the important things with these patients is to remember CNS, uh, the, the risk of CNS progression. Um, on the left is our data suggesting how these patients do with various strategy, again, retrospectively, and on the right is the MD Anderson experience showing the, the risk of CNS progression over time with these patients, and it's pretty substantial, approaching 15%. When I have a patient who has MIC rearrangements or double hit, I, I, I essentially universally stage their CSF because I think they are at, at, at higher risk for that kind of disease, and we will treat them with methotrexate containing regimens. I, I can't give you clear evidence that that really improves outcomes, but it is something that we routinely do in, in practice. The role of transplant and first remission, another interesting area of debate. Now, neither, of a, neither we nor MD Anderson showed a significant improvement, but I do think when you look at our data that, that um, has a, a, a pretty good plateau in that survival curve, it suggests that maybe there is a role for these patients. And, you know, it's, it's something that we'll probably never really have an answer to with a randomized prospective study. But I do interpret data like this in my own clinical practice to say there might be a role for, for consolidative uh, transplant, particularly for those patients who don't achieve an early and complete remission. Now, if you look at prognostic scores, the IPI uh, seems to make a difference for these patients, but, but other factors do as well. So, what we did is through multivariate analysis, we actually identified our, our own factors for these patients that might be uh, uh, helpful. And those include leukocytosis and LDH greater than three times the upper limit of normal, Ann Arbor stage, three or four disease, uh, or CNS involvement. Now, part of the reason we chose to look at LDH above three times the upper limit of normal is because there's a so-called NCCN IPI that was recently reported in blood that suggests that that's a, a perhaps a better discriminator for diffuse large B cell lymphoma than just saying LDH above normal. So we went and looked at that as well. Now, <clears throat> when we, when we um, submitted this for publication to JCO, we got rejected. In part, one of the critiques was that, well, you actually identify a very low number of patients who are low risk with your novel prognostic score. We only have 14 patients out of 300. And that's true, but the interesting thing is if you look at those, all those patients got RCHOP and did quite well. And so another important point 
that I think flies below the radar with many people is just because you have a double hit lymphoma doesn't mean that the IPI or these biological risk factors aren't important. I think if they really are truly low risk, RCHOP is still a, a, a legitimate consideration for such patients. One of the most important things is upon relapse, these patients tend to do very poorly, especially when fish defined. There's uh, technically a difference here between doing palliative and uh, intensive second line treatment, but it's not much of a difference. And you can see these, these survival curves uh, es essentially fall like, like rocks. Now the interesting thing is what is poorly described until ironically just a couple days ago was when I saw this article, is what happens with the double expressor or double protein lymphomas in relapse. There really is not a lot of data on this. There was this retrospective study using a regimen called um, R IVAD, and this is a, a paper out of Japan, and it showed that these patients really do poorly with a second line intensive treatment. However, if I can just toggle back and forth, if you look at this uh, survival curve here with double expressor proteins, you know, we're, we're seeing something of a plateau. Now, this is very small numbers, but I do think if you look at a survival curve of 30 versus down at 10, there's probably at least a hint that the double expressors and this, this corresponds with our clinical experience as well. The double expressors or the double protein lymphoma patients probably have a little more salvageability with second line treatment as compared to the true double hits. The true double hits, I, I, I shudder to even think about second line treatment as opposed to a clinical trial just because their, their outcomes tend to be so poor and the, the, the disease so aggressive. But it's also important to remember from studies like this that these are enriched. I know this is small, it's hard to see, but, but uh, about 50% of these patients, once you get to a relapse refractory setting, will have double expression. And just a, another thought about uh, in terms of frontline treatment, I, the, my other title for this is uh, what we talk about when we talk about hyper CVAD. And that is a really, and this is, a, this is from a randomized study, this is not from, from double hit or double expressing proteins. These are unselected diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients that were treated in a prospective randomized trial at MD Anderson. I think this, this trial flew under the radar of a lot of people, but when you when you look at what the grade five toxicities are, we're talking about 10%. And it's gonna be very hard to show a survival advantage to an intensive regimen when you're picking 10% of these people off with, with you know, killing them really with, with toxicity and giving them basically a 94% chance of grade four toxicity and a lot of cessation of treatment and de-escalation down to RCHOP or other regimens anyway. And so I think it's always going to be difficult to really know that you're doing anything heroic by giving hyper CVAD to these patients. So uh, to conclude um, with respect to my treatment approaches to double hit lymphoma, I do think we should universally screen for MYC in these patients. In our institution, then we reflexively go look at BCL2, BCL6, and those who are MYC positive by FISH. For now, I would ignore MYC gain of copy or amplification. I don't know that that has any prognostic significance. And I do think that most patients with double hit lymphoma should be treated with escalated regimens. I do think exceptions include those who have low IPI risk scores. And I do think that the aggregate of data, experience, and comfort level leads me to go out on a little bit of a, a limb here and say I think EPOC, for lack of a better alternative, is kind of as, as good as a backbone as any. Um, and it's, and it's probably one we're going to evaluate in, in future trials as sort of our standard bearer for this disease, but that is not based on any great level of data. I do think transplant and first consideration should be a consideration. My routine practice is to consider this more for those patients who don't achieve an early uh, 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 complete response. And I do think that it's important to remember that true double hits essentially have very little chance of successful salvage even in second line, and I think these patients should be referred for clinical trials uh, with novel agents plus minus chemotherapy uh, immediately upon uh, any relapse or progression. Now, with respect to the double protein and double expressors, I do think that there is this, this sort of standardization of, of MYC at 40% and BCL2 above 70%, but other authors have looked at other cutoffs so I don't know that that's written in stone, but we, we have taken to routinely screening these patients, partly as a, a view towards the future. 
I think more studies are going to look at this population. I know we're planning to as part of an intergroup study. Um, but I think this is how we're going to uh, identify and evaluate a more substantial subset of diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, unfortunately, than simply the double hits, just because uh, numerically it's a, a more feasible number. I do think that escalated induction should be considered for these patients, but we actually have very little data showing that there's any benefit uh, as compared to RCHOP, retrospective or prospective, in these double protein or double expressing patients. Uh, and I think most of, most of our desire to escalate is simply based on poor outcomes demonstrated with CHOP. Likewise, the role of transplant is not well established for these patients. And I do think that unlike the true double hits, the double protein or double expressors might be better candidates for quote unquote standard salvage and then consolidation uh, uh, transplant because I think these patients are more salvageable based on personal experience and what limited data there is that these patients can be better salvaged than the true double hits. Now just a couple quick thoughts about where the field is moving. Uh, I just have a couple more slides here. I am not a biochemist. This is Mick. Mick is a transcription factor, and I am taught that this does not have a good lipophilic druggable pocket. It's very hard, hard to target Mick. I don't think that we're going to target the protein itself successfully anytime soon. One of the approaches has been to instead target its... Um, its expression, or uh, I should say its transcription, and part of the way that that, that has been done in recent efforts is to uh, do so with uh, bromodomain uh, extraterminal inhibitors, or BET inhibitors. And this is one area of active research for patients with relapsed refractory disease. Another is to target, of course, the BCL2, the other offender there, and we, we have a BCL2 inhibitor that should be FDA approved early next year for CLL. Uh, that comes to us uh, from, from AbbVie. It's venetoclax, uh, also known as ABT199 or GDC0199. There is some activity observed in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients. Another potentially promising drug is Selinexor, which is a, a, a novel mechanism of action type of drug. It's a selective inhibitor of nuclear export. And we see that based on preclinical data, it certainly downregulates down the activity of MYC and of BCL2, and it might have a role for these patients. There's also been some limited data uh, in patients with double expressing lymphoma who've had long term responses to this drug, um, and it, it might be a promising agent for incorporation into uh, future studies. With that, I will uh, stop, and uh, thank you for your uh, attention.